Well, I'm very, very pleased to be here. Interesting forum. I will take the opportunity to take you through a little bit of travel in time from sort of uh, the, the recent past into the future. And hopefully through the course of the pre presentation, you will see how it, how it all connects. So we, we titled the presentation, The Power Train of Choice. And um, part of that is, is actually, there is not that, that one size fits all answer um, to really make, uh, and, uh, make a difference and move the needle. So if you look at what are the challenges we have ahead of us, it's clearly emissions legislation, greenhouse effects, limited fossil fuels, a lot of the things we heard about, but also including safety. And in a city like London, as you, you can well imagine, so the whole thing of congestion, traffic management comes into play and actually is directly connected into uh, fuel efficiency uh, range and, and range anxiety and what have you. And if you look at that sort of spectrum of challenges, it doesn't really matter whether you take a different view on greenhouse effects or some of the other in single ingredients here. It all drives you in the same direction, that you really have to sort of bulk change the needle on the way we are using energy for transportation. And bulk changing the needle, I mean, uh, it does not only play a role that you move the needle on halo pro products, you also have to move it on the bulk. So if you look at the, the fourth strategy, which is laid out here, we quite some while back, about 10 years ago, we uh, decided we really have to uh, do our contribution to the 450 ppm CO2 glide path in terms of uh, moving our fleet to achieve future uh, fuel efficiency. So what we have already in the market today, and you can buy it, is uh, EcoBoost technology. Uh, we have our Econetic diesel products out there. Um, so a lot of the vehicles already are equipped with sort of the beginning part of the continuum of electrification, which is the start-stop piece, or sometimes called micro-hybrids. Um, another piece to the puzzle is, yeah, you can be more efficient in drawing the propulsion energy from different sources, but another piece is actually the vehicle needs to consume less to move around, which is a challenge on its own because safety standards, equipment level expected by the customer, all of that is going up. So uh, while you're trying to be more efficient, you are having to take sort of more features around um, to, to drive and uh, sort of still make it all work. Um, what people don't know that often is we are not new to the hybrid, to sort of the electrified world. Um, since 2004, we are mass producer in the U.S. for full, uh, full hybrid cars, and we have a quarter million vehicles on the road. So it's not only Toyota. And uh, while it's not known in Europe, it has a lot to do with the diesel history of the European market. But the technology is available. It's, uh, it's fully mature. So going further now um, into sort of the, the near future, uh, we have still a lot of room in developing the, uh, the, um, the current technology mainstream into actually the next level of performance, the next level of fuel efficiency. But then we do actually get into uh, electric vehicles. So the, uh, the Focus electric vehicle um, is available very soon. We are getting in the U.S. actually it is on sale already, so you can have it. We are getting into the plug-in hybrids um, in, the, in the U.S. this year and in the very near near future in Europe, um, but we're also getting into traffic management uh, systems. So while sort of driver assist systems are known today, um, which are sort of more like sort of forecasts on, the, on your journey on traffic jams, etc., getting that to the next level of car-to-car, car-to-infrastructure uh, uh, communication, you can actually actively manage traffic and avoid the waste of energy by congestion and uh, taking the most energy efficient route rather than just the quickest route without jams. So, um, and then going further, 2020 and beyond, um, what's then happening to the conventional world of combustion engines depends a lot on uh, where we are taking sort of the, the, the fuel from we are burning. Um, you're all reading in the press of what's going on around the debate on first gen, second gen biofuels. Um, in terms of having a burnable fuel in the car, a liquid, hybrid, hyd a liquid hydrocarbon is just a very, very good fuel to carry around. Because what I haven't heard in all the good discussions around uh, um, methane and hydrogen and battery is sort of the energy density in the vehicle um, and the amount of package space it takes away, the, uh, the, uh, the weight it takes away, the cost it, ta it uh, in terms of manufacturing it, um, it takes to actually put the storage on the vehicle. 
So liquid hydrocarbon is just unbeatable in that kind of an energy density package vehicle weight efficiency scale. So if you find a way of producing this liquid hydrocarbon from a renewable source of any type, um, this, it doesn't mean there's necessarily the end of the liquid hydrocarbon um, engine in the near future. There will be, of course, an increased uh, market share of, of hybrids, plug-in hybrids, battery electric vehicles. They definitely have their role that pl uh, to play. They have an increasing role going into the future. They have all the benefits which we have talked about here, specifically in congested areas, the, the locally emission-free operation, the quiet operation. Quiet operation is a challenge as well for, for, for some people who don't hear the car coming. So, and fuel cell vehicle plays a role in that one as well. So that is just sort of a broad overview on the strategic elements as a full-line manufacturer as Ford is, so we can't just concentrate on, on one piece of the puzzle here. So on that next slide, you now see sort of the ingredients of uh, how we get there of actually um, making the car uh, more efficient with the conventional side. So we planted it as econotic, uh, econetic technologies. So uh, pieces of that is um, going into the, uh, the range of electrification. Pieces of it is going into actually making the vehicle as such more efficient. So you see it here, smart regenerative charging, electric grill shutter to only sort of use, uh, to, to effectively optimize aerodynamic where you need it, stop the car in congested traffic with auto stop start, Modern combustion engine, either EcoBoost on gasoline or the Econetic, the diesel, uh, diesel route. And then uh, we have some Halo products, uh, which are the blue bubbles at the bottom, where we combine the, the, the mainstream technologies aer with aerodynamic kits, longer final uh, drive, and also uh, long, low rolling assistant tires. So the bundle of that technology, um, of those technologies, actually allow quite a lot to be achieved on a more conventional front. But it's not only about uh, the powertrain uh, to actually deliver the fuel efficiency. There's other factors here. Um, there's the weight equation, and sort of the, the top left sort of shows a bit on sort of the weight going in in terms of extra equipment and for safety and entertainment, what have you. But then design efficiency and modern materials sort of taking weight back out. So net, we actually do scale down in weight somewhat, despite the extra content of the vehicles. And 100 kilograms of weight saving is about 3% of fuel saving. Then you see the active grill setter uh, shutter mentioned on the previous slide of what it looks like in the car, uh, low rolling assistant tires. So another piece we already mentioned is the cloud connectivity. So beyond the current driver assistant systems, the car to, uh, to X communication, the intermodality. So in the future, we will see more models of you're not necessarily just one buying one car. You're, you're buying effectively access to, to transportation. Uh, in some combined way um, to address specifically the, the issues in congested areas. So what do we mean with power of choice? Is that we are a full-line manufacturer. We just can't afford to just um, set on just, just one solution. We are producing globally. The, the demand in India is very different to the demand of sort of farming in the U.S. or mainstream Europe. So there's not one, one size fits all. We, we really have to move the needle across the board. So some examples of the power of choice here in terms of the powertrain choices you have. You have sort of the EcoBoost, I uh, have a bit more on that one. Uh, you have Auto Stop Start, Focus Electric, C-Max Energy. But it's not like... We haven't done anything. It's actually not too long ago that if you look at sort of the diesels in the sort of uh, mid-90s were uh, 180 plus grams CO2. And if you uh, sort of look over sort of the sort of conventional, almost unrecognized technology migration, which is coming into um, modern diesel cars, not only got they clean with particulate filters and NOx after treatment, the latest uh, generation of cars, they actually, we are now with the new Focus uh, Econetic 3, we are uh, at 88 gram uh, of CO2. This is not electric vehicle levels uh, or plug-in hybrid levels, but it's damn good. It's using exactly the infrastructure available for everybody. It, can, it has uh, absolutely no limitations in use for the, ever, uh, sort of the average family customer, and it's completely f affordable for the average family. Uh, diesel has uh, because diesel was historically sort of the uh, in contrast to the U.S. where it's more the the hybrid uh, piece uh, in Europe um, that has been the choice for the 
um, yeah, cost-conscious customer. So the development has started a bit earlier and faster on the diesel in terms of getting to uh, fuel-efficient products. But even on the gasoline side, in the more recent past, um, if we, uh, while there was sort of a period of stagnation where sort of technology added was more used for power increases, and the uh, reduction in fuel consumption was somewhat moderate. So the la latest generation actually now is bringing, you could almost say bringing diesel technology into the gasoline cars by boosting them, by direct injecting them. Uh, you effectively uh, do a step improvement. And in our case, we just won on the three-cylinder, one-liter engine, um, the, uh, the international engine of the year. Three-cylinder engines have sort of been around for a while, and they have been connected with uh, being cheap, being poor man's solutions. And as you can see, that three-cylinder has all the high-tech available uh, included to actually go to get to those kind of remarkable uh, performance numbers and fuel efficiency numbers we have on it. Scale is an, an availability to the average customer is, is really an element of uh, making the future work and, and making, making a dent here. And uh, on the fourth side, this year, by the end of the year, you will have 15 vehicles across all sorts of applications from Fiesta to sort of family vans to uh, Transort CV vehicle, uh, which are uh, class-leading fuel economy in their respective segment. So you really have the ability to do something for the environment uh, without uh, necessarily having to have the, the deep pockets of the early adapter. This is sort of the, the econetic version, sort of the, the convention technology, a halo with an 87-gram Fiesta and an 88-gram uh, Focus. Um, this doesn't mean, however, we are neglecting uh, the next step going into the future. So I guess one of the reasons I showed sort of the diesel and gasoline history is 15 years ago, we wouldn't have dreamed of being sub-100 grams with a conventional vehicle or sub-120 grams or around 110 grams on gasoline uh, engines. Um, and here we are, and it's now sort of a, a seven-digit production volume over the next coming years with that kind of technology. So really, really getting into the market and moving something. So we do have, in addition, um, the work going on on sort of the next step into electrification. And uh, for me, it isn't electrification versus the other technology. It's actually shades of gray coming in and driving to more and more uh, electrification. The first step in that is stop, start, micro-hybrid, smart region charging, which is effectively on almost every vehicle we sell by now. The next step then is moving into actual um, full hybrid, like we in the U.S. are on sale for the better part of a decade now. Um, and um, on that one, then you already have uh, the combination of sort of avoiding wasting brake energy and being able to take the maximum out of ever, every liter of, uh, of fuel and, and crude. Um, uh, and in a full hybrid, you have a sort of no compromise vehicle. It's a fully functional vehicle. Um, sort of going the next step beyond that then is sort of you get into plug-in. Um, plug-in hybrid, um, we have chosen to actually choose an architecture which is building on the experience of the full hybrid. So it is actually a full hybrid, so even if you're running out of the battery for the electric uh, fully emissions-free range, you have a fully functional vehicle um, with, with no compromise, you have no compromise in range, um, uh, and we, we decided as a bridge to sort of the future that is probably the safer solution for getting over customer nervousness and anxiety um, as uh, opposed to the alternative, for example, to do a range extender, which also avoids getting stranded. But in our definition, a range extender means that when you're out of electric range, your vehicle has some sort of impairment. It's either no longer delivering full power or some other, uh, some other functions of the car are not fully maintained when you're out of the electrical range but it was a range extender. So we decided on a plug-in concept which doesn't have that compromise once you are running out of electric range. But for the average commute, 95% of your trips you can still do on the battery charge and, uh, and derive all the benefits the previous presenters talked about. And then the next step for where it fits, where you have the drive cycle, where you have the conditions, we have the Focus Electric available uh, in late 2012 in, uh, in US already on sales. It has uh, the typical kind of on that segment, uh, 100 miles range, 160 kilometers. Um, top speed, completely competitive for the kind of environment you drive a vehicle like that, 23 kilowatt hours of battery. And investing into the future, we for a very, very long time have worked on fuel cells. 
Um, we are in a joint venture with, with Daimler. It is making progress. It's coming down in, in cost. Um, we have um, actually more than a million miles um, practical experience with the fleet test in the Berlin-based uh, partnership, clean energy partnership. Um, so um, we are keeping a very uh, close eye on that one uh, and actually are still actively engaged and uh, developing the technology. We also have um, developed uh, hydrogen combustion engines to a level of maturity which would allow to, to deploy them with almost sort of no delay. Um, and uh, yes, the fuel cell is in the end of the day the most efficient, but a um, um, combustion engine hydrogen hybrid gets very, very close in terms of all, overall efficiency. So the message here from, from Ford, so to say, is um, if we have hydrogen available and we have the infrastructure, it won't be the vehicle technology slowing the introduction down. If the fuel cell isn't there in terms of cost, there will be alternative ways of using it. So that chicken and egg is not necessarily really driven by, uh, by the vehicle manufacturers. So how does it all connect? Why do we need sort of when we have those great technologies, we are de delivering the ultimate fuel economy saving? Um, why are we still putting so much effort on the conventional? And that's what I tried to illustrate in that bar. You see on the left the massive challenge of CO2 reduction. And yes, per vehicle, a better electric vehicle, plug-in hybrid, hybrids have a massive leverage in terms of reducing CO2. But um, what we can do, the, the 10, 15, 20 percent improvement on the gasoline and, and diesel cars, because they are immediately compatible with the infrastructure, they are no compromise to the customer, they are affordable, they are produced in millions rather than in hundreds or thousands, and therefore the leverage to actually move the needle for the environment and for the future um, is currently still bigger on the conventional uh, side, and that's why we are not neglecting that development despite putting a lot of efforts on, into the future technologies. So, conclusion, no silver bullet on the horizon. Green technologies uh, have to go beyond powertrain, including lightweight solutions, and the high volume technologies have the bigger, uh, bigger effect on the environment, even though the rest is very important and we are taking it seriously and we are launching the appropriate products. Thank you very much.